So my name is John, and I'm uh, part of the pastoral team here. And this series, we are sort of doing practices of Jesus. These are practices that we build into our relationships with each other. Maybe not all the practices that you would have considered when you think of things like spiritual disciplines, but these are things that you can put into place in your life. And I want to talk to you about mentoring. Mentoring happens in some very beautiful and powerful ways. And I have a saying that I've used a few times. It goes like, have a mentor and be a mentor. And every time I say that, I get myself into trouble because people will say, so John, will you mentor me? The answer is usually, uh, my, like my dance card's full. Like I'm, I'm mentoring lots of people. My response is, who's the one person in your life that God's bringing to your mind? They're the face that come to your mind Why don't you mentor them? Because you will grow so much more by mentoring somebody, frankly, than by being mentored. You will grow as you invest your life in someone else. In the Bible, that's called discipling. I've had the joy of uh, mentoring a few people, and and one of them, one time, a guy says, would you mentor me? And and I said, I'm not so sure. And, And we had lunch. I said, yeah, sure, come and join these other two guys who are already meeting. They had uh, said, there's something I'd like to talk to you about. And at the end of each of those conversations, it wound up, let's meet together. And so the four of us met on Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. And then our schedule shifted to become Thursdays at 1230. But it was every single week. It was a relationship with significant commitment. We read the Bible together. We prayed together. And Daniel and Stephen, Stephen's here today with a brand new baby. Shout out to you, Stephen. And Dan and... uh, And myself, and we would read the Bible together. We would pray together. We would discuss the challenges that we were facing in our homes and in our workplaces. And we asked each other hard questions. We challenged each other. And and this was a, a relationship that transformed my life even as I was pouring into a few other guys. Mentoring is something that that God creates for us as a way of expressing and investing our lives in somebody else. Because I believe people have potential that God intends us to share. God's given you a purpose and he intends you to share your potential with someone else. When people say, if mentoring is such a big deal, John, then where's the program I can commit to and plug into? Well, Jesus said, when he gave us the Great Commission, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Therefore, go and make disciples. He didn't say go and join a program to make sure that relationship, may, that relationship changes your life. See, life-on-life life discipleship changes our circumstances. Discipleship is really what happens when you take the word discipline and the word relationship and you mash them up and put them together. Discipleship and relationship. And then discipleship has a number of really critical parts of it. There's relationship and training. We're going to invest in someone else. There's relationship and empowerment. We're going to give somebody else opportunities. This is something that can be really transformative in my life. I've watched this happen in my daughter's life as she has asked somebody to mentor her and the change and the transformation that's occurred in her life because she meets with another woman on a regular basis has, um, it's given me a new and I'll say better version of my daughter because this relationship has offered to her things that, well, frankly, she probably wouldn't have received or heard from me as a dad. Who are you mentoring? The question is not who's going to mentor you, it's who are you going to invest your life in? In the Bible, there's a man by the name of Barnabas that is sort of held up as the model of what mentoring can look like. And I'm going to walk through a few verses in the story of Barnabas. If you ever go to Bible Gateway, it's a great online Bible resource, and you type into the um, search bar a name or a word, you can do a quick word study. I typed in Barnabas. It gives me 33 indications of Barnabas. Most of those occur, if you've got really good eyes, in the book of Acts. And um, we're going to take a look at some of these. And in the book of Acts, we discover that Barnabas was called the son of encouragement. That means his dad already had a reputation. His dad already had... And, and, and Barnabas' life was one of being an encourager because he said it sold, he sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet so that the needs of the church could be provided for. It, he was about making a difference, and he was known as the encourager. Now, Saul is a man who had persecuted Christians. 
He had gotten letters of authority so that he could go from city to city and arrest Christians because he believed that they were, and they were destroying the Jewish religion and they were against God. And Barnabas takes, in Acts 9, took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he, that is Saul, preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And so Saul stayed with them and moved freely about Jerusalem. Barnabas was his advocate. If you're going to mentor somebody, if you're going to disciple somebody, you are going to be their advocate. You're going to represent opportunities that they should consider, and you're going to make a door open for them. We take a look at Acts chapter 11. Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Tarsus is nowhere near Jerusalem. Barnabas sets out to pursue this young man who he wanted to influence, who he wanted to shape. And, and, and Barnabas took initiative. Barnabas went to an extraordinary effort. I want to invite you to consider in whose life are you going to take initiative? Where are you going to make an extraordinary effort so one other person can grow? And it says then Barnabas and Saul finished their mission. They returned from to Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. So we discover that Barnabas and Saul, who's also called Paul, if you use the Greek, his Greek name, that they were out doing stuff together. If you're going to mentor or disciple somebody, you're going to do stuff together. And they will learn by observing what you do and how you do it. But also, Barnabas was already planting in Saul's life the seeds, the patterns of discipleship. They already took another young guy along. His name was John Mark. The same John Mark that writes the Gospel of Mark that we read of in the Bible. And then we get to chapter 13. And a cool thing happens in chapter 13. Um, there's a, a role switch. So we see that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, that's the whole church, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed hands on them and they sent them off. And then there was this proconsul. His name is Sergius. He's the Roman governing authority in this city. He's an intelligent man. He sends for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. And then the next mention of Barnabas' name in this chapter, the roles are reversed. And Paul and Barnabas, as they were leaving the synagogue, people invited them to speak further about these things on the Sabbath. People were not looking to Barnabas. They were beginning to look to Paul. And when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who talked to them and encouraged them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. And then the conflict has arisen, and, and Paul and Barnabas, speaking to the Jewish leaders, answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. And Paul is learning his boldness from Barnabas. And, and then we continue... Another mention of Barnabas' name, some time later, Paul and Barnabas said, let, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached. Paul is now taking the lead in the relationship because that's what happens when we invest our lives in someone else. You don't forever mentor somebody. After a while, they begin to lead you in some powerful and profound ways. And then... We continue, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him. And Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued in the work. Mark bailed, Paul was not impressed, but Barnabas is going, I'm a man of second chances. And, and they had a disagreement over this. So Paul chose Silas, Barnabas took Mark, Paul chose Silas, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And he went throughout Syria and Sicilia. Two men continuing the pattern of mentorship. I'll tell you that very often women have done better at mentoring than men. Because women have been giving priority to relationship while often men have begun giving priority to, ta to task. And so here's a call out to men to stand up and step out and mentor as has been so well modeled by many women in the life of the church. Who are you investing your life in? 
Who, or who is God calling you to invest your life in? You can see a face. You can hear a name. I would encourage you to do what Barnabas did, to take the initiative to be an advocate, to open a door of opportunity, to share your life with somebody and show them how you live. Because mentoring is a powerful form of influence. I believe that the most powerful form of leadership that's available to most of us is a life modeled for somebody else. You see, the life you live is the most powerful message that you have and can share. There's a pattern of mentoring in the Bible that we see in Barnabas that I want to make really clear for you. There's a five-step pattern. I'll do it, you watch, and then we're going to talk about it. We'll debrief it. And then I do it, you help. And then we'll talk about it, we'll debrief it. How did that go? And then you do it, I'll help. And then we'll debrief it again. And then you do it, I'll watch. And then we'll debrief it. And then you go and do it with someone else. Repeat the pattern. You see, when Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations. He wasn't asking us each individually to disciple a whole nation. He was asking us to do it with one other person. My friends, we don't have a mentoring program. You are the mentoring program. We don't have a discipleship program. We are the discipleship program. And we step out and we lead one other person to grow spiritually using the gifts that God's given them to fulfill the potential that they have, that God's already placed in them as we open doors of opportunity, as we walk alongside them and show them how to do this for themselves. Have a mentor. But more importantly, be a mentor. Because that's what God invites each of us to. Think of the difference that you will make in someone's life when this becomes true.